Hello and welcome to this latest in a series of NR Times Roundtable discussions. My name is Alistair McCall. Uh, I'm delighted to be hosting this discussion today on behalf of NR Times. Today we're focusing on the rising stars of case management. So we'll have a look at and discuss what great case management looks like. We'll talk about the challenges and opportunities faced by case managers and we'll touch on leadership, innovation, and the future of case management as well. Uh, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to introduce themselves in a moment. And we do have a fantastic panel uh, who have agreed to share their experience and their insight with us today. A uh, couple of things I should mention with reference to NR Times. Uh, we've got the NR Times Awards coming up shortly. Nominations for all categories, including case management firm of the year, close in September the 30th. So uh, get your nominations in, please. And if you're not already an NR Times member, have a look at the platform. Uh, there are three tiers of membership available and benefits include a double page profile in our printed yearbook and 24 articles published in NR Times uh, over the course of the year and a seat uh, on a round table discussion of your choice. So uh, those are the plugs with reference to NR Times. Uh, let's move on much more importantly to our panelists. Uh, and I'm gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves, say a few words uh, about themselves, their organization and their areas of specific interest. And if I can come to you first, Nikki, please. Certainly. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Nikki Smith. I'm a director of Stanley Smith Case Management, and we're a case management company that covers the southwest of England. Uh, we have a team of about 15 case managers, all highly experienced, and we cover all areas of case management. We've often found ourselves receiving a lot of complex uh, referrals, and that's due to the um, amazing kind of standard of clinician that works with us. I'm a neurophysio by profession. Um, I'm still clinical as well. I like to keep myself clinically current. Um, a lot of our case managers that work with us do exactly the same. Um, uh, I love the world of case management. It's such a brilliant area to be able to sort of uh, impact and, and you know make a positive change on the clients. So I'm really excited to be here with all the other other experts around the table. That's fantastic. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, if I can ask you, Joe, to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Alistair, and thank you for the introduction this morning. Yes, I'm the CEO of Unite Professionals Case Management. We're a national company um, delivering case management in complex polytrauma, spinal cord injury, brain injury. We've got 36 case managers throughout the country. Unfortunately, not in Scotland, Alistair, but um, we do travel. We do cover the rest of the country and we have a fantastic internal team of 22 other staff in compliance, finance and our amazing team of rehab coordinators and care coordinators. Um, as Nikki, I find case management and the evolving uh, industry fascinating. It's wonderful to be able to walk alongside people who have complex situations, um, helping them to problem solve those situations and sort of re-get their lives back, I guess. So that is my love of case management. And I know it's um, what, what makes our team enjoy every day what we do. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and it sounds as though it won't be long before we see you north of the border. Uh, Stephen. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you to NR Times and Alistair uh, for having me back. It was only a few months ago that I was on one of these roundtables, so it was nice to be invited back. I guess I did something right last time, um, but uh, it was really enjoyable, and I'm sure this one will be as well. So I'm Stephen Ackerman. I'm a solicitor at Brian Barr Solicitors. Um, we're a, quite a small niche firm. We're based in the Northwest, but our um, reach is nationwide. And obviously we do uh, deal with people, people in Scotland, but obviously their accidents have to be related to England because it's a separate um, jurisdiction, legal jurisdiction. We're not licensed to practice law in Scotland, but we have had clients, um, I've had a, had a, 
uh, very fond memories of a, of a Scottish client. Uh, she lived up in the Highlands, but her accent was down in England. Um, so we, we helped her. And as with the case managers, I find the work that I do um, extremely rewarding. Um, people People's lives have been changed. The system we have in the NHS and all the governmental systems are fantastic, but of course, everything is strained, everything's limited. So we, you know, working with our partners, you know, experts, case managers, whoever it may be, um, OTs, we can really help people get that extra help that they need to, um, you know, make their lives as comfortable and as fulfilling as possible because just because somebody needs a case manager or anything like that doesn't mean their life can, is any less fulfilling than any other person. It's just in a different way. And we try to facilitate that. Um, and as, as a lawyer, when an insurance company is trying to pay as little as possible, it's really fulfilling when we get a fantastic result for our clients. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And fantastic to have you back on this round table. Uh, Shabnam. Hi, everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks also for the invite to be here today. So I'm Shabnam Berry Khan. Um, I am an advanced Babakim case manager. Um, I'm also a clinical psychologist by training background, and I'm the managing director at PsychWorks Associates. We are a case management and treating psychology service, so bringing a slightly different angle to some of the work um, out there. Um, and so our focus tends to be a little bit more on sort of trauma-informed support um, to our seriously and catastrophically injured clients, but also their families as well. That's really important to us. Um, we do have nationwide coverage across our service, although our case management team is emanating mostly from the southeast um, of England. Um, we have a um, also a particular interest in diversity and belonging, um, with a, a particular interest in, in sort of ethnicity um, within that diversity umbrella term. Um, so our interest uh, in the work that we offer it has a, an emotional responses flavour, if you like, um, thinking about the mind body connect. Um, and, and the experiences and the journeys of our clients in their personal injury um, new normal life, if you like. And as I mentioned before, um, systemic focus is particularly of interest where we think about the family's needs as well as the professional network's needs. Our thinking behind that is that um, our clients can only do as well as the network of professionals around them. And therefore, we have a, uh, a responsibility, if you like, to think about um, scaffold the scaffolding around our clients um, in the form of that professional network. And so we do tend to think about how we can support at that level as much as the core of the client level as well. Thanks very much, Shabnam. And last but not least, uh, Sophie. Hi, Alistair. Thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, good morning, all. So my name is Sophie. I'm a case manager um, at Kapore Case Management. So Kapore are a national based case management service. Um, we deal with both multi trauma and catastrophic cases, as well as kind of desktop cases. Um, our clinicians, some of them are additionally kind of trained in vocational rehab and can support return to work and work site assessments. Um, I'm a neurophysio by background, so my love of neuro rehab brought me into case management when um, uh, I felt I could do a little bit more from a case management perspective than, than a physiotherapist. Um, so, as I say, my basis is neuro rehab, but I also love um, amputees and complex orthopaedic motor traumas. Uh, thanks, Sophie, and thanks to all of our panellists for those introductions. I'm going to go around the panellists again now uh, and ask each of the panellists to say a few words about their perspective on what exceptional case management looks like within their organisation. And when I say exceptional, you know, uh, those things that really stand out for clients and their families. And Stephen, I'm sure you'll give us a legal perspective on that. But uh, Nikki, if we could start with you, exceptional case management. What does it look like? What does it mean? What do you have to do to achieve it? How long have you got? Um, it's um, exceptional case management to me is obviously, and you hear this a lot, but it's obviously client centred. Um, it's incredibly important for the case manager that's working with the client to ensure that they've got the right skills to do so. So they need to have a very good understanding of the condition that that the client's presenting with, the injury, you know, the um, 
all the MDT that, that is going to be needed around them. Uh, so they need to have that base. They um, also need to have a really good working relationship. I've often found um, throughout my years of working as a case manager, I started working as a case manager in 2008. And I've, I've found that sometimes you might have that case manager that has all the right skills to work with that client. But actually, when they come together, they, they just don't hit it off so there's got to be that also connection to be able to work with that client because case management is quite um personal um you get to know the client really well you get to know their families really well you need to have great communication skills to be able to kind of negotiate and discuss um some of the can be quite sensitive topics that we deal with in case management um, and you need to have a really cohesive approach so that you are working um, really um, uh, efficiently with everybody involved. Um, a, a, also, a great knowledge of all the local um, services around that client is incredibly helpful and um, also means that it's cost efficient as well because uh, you're not taking time to have to research and, and find things out. Um, it is also often better if your case manager is, particularly if you're needing to pop in to see the case, uh, to see the client, is if your case manager is fairly close geographically. Um, I know there are some cases that can be done via desktop, and we certainly can do those as well. Um, and I know there are certain um, cases where a lot of remote working is incredibly useful and helpful and, and, and keeps the cost down, which again is fantastic. But if you are working with a client that you need to be able to kind of go in and visit, then having being, you know, fairly local to that client is also really helpful. Um, I could go on forever, but I'm going to actually let other people speak if that's okay. <laughs> That's fantastic, Nikki, and, and thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I do appreciate that as we go around the panellists, there'll be many things you agree on. So maybe you could pick out those things that are, you know, particular to your experience or organisation. Jo? Thank you. Um, Nikki, I would say ditto. <laughs> but I, I think you made some great points there. I think the only other thing I'd expand on with that is, is, Personally, I think the industry is changing hugely and uh, the other stakeholders that we work, we interface with. So the legal profession, who, whose client it is, and the insurers, as you touched on, Stephen, they're changing all the time. Case laws coming in, which challenges case management practice. So I think for us, um, as, as Nikki said, the proximity to clients, making sure that you are acting in an, advers uh, in an advocacy way so actually great case management is almost in, sort of um, invisible <laughs> in a way you're sort of in the background you've got great um, networks of rehab providers who are well governanced and um, compliant with what we need as a background in case management our Babacom and CMS UK standards provide us with a great benchmark for good practice the other thing I'm noticing with the case law and the industry currently is the importance of supervision, really close supervision, somebody who understands and can support those case managers in unpicking complex situations. It also allows for continuity if case managers fall poorly, as we do, um, and uh, uh, and or, or go on annual leave, as hopefully we do. You know, that continuity for the for the claimant's client is super important. Um, the, the the other thing I, I you know I, I feel is is really important is a great back room team. Um, so a culture that work together. It's seamless um, in terms of managing safeguarding situations, which are increasingly prevalent out there. Um, managing uh, dif difficult situations um, that, that come up, that, that culture of having a background team that you can trust and will support the case manager who is rightly out front with all of their clinical skills. I'm an OT by background, but a lot of our case managers are nurses, OTs, physios. And actually that, that background and that training is different to what you use in case management. They're a different set of skills. So making sure that you don't burn out. Um, we don't want good case managers burning out. We need to look after ourselves to be able to give the best service possible 
to these clients on sometimes, particularly in these complex cases, a very protracted, difficult journey because our society is changing. Um, its resilience is, is sometimes teetering. Um, and so a, a strong culture is something that I feel uh, we work on daily. As Nikki, I will hand over now, Alistair. Great. Thanks very much, Jo. Uh, Stephen, what does it look like from the perspective of Brian Barr, yourself and your colleagues? Right. So I think th there are some underlying principles that I think remain the same throughout, whether you, uh, you're addressing this from a legal perspective or obviously from the actual um, health perspective directly. Obviously, the legal does touch on the health, obviously, because we need to know that perspective to help know what damages to claim and recover on behalf of the claimant. But first and foremost, as um, Nikki and Joe said, is is that relationship. I think even before you come to your expertise, which is obviously all important, but you have to have uh, an excellent working relationship, not only with the client, but with their family. Uh, families can be complex, we all know, and the interplay. And um, I think once you have that, you get, get along well um, with uh, the client and the family, I think everything else does fall into place because they trust you. You have to talk about very personal things. So you have to talk about their background. A lot of my clients, unfortunately, have a very troubled psychological history, physical history, whatever it may be, and they have to feel comfortable enough to open up to you because we need to know that because um, their claims can be attacked um, based on what they went through not related to the accident and is it all related to the accident and then before that impacts what the case manager can claim as part of the legal claim so that working relationship i think um is 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 all important and you know my my one of my colleagues who i trained under actually told me and i really do agree with him is that maybe what's more important than my law degree in the job that i do is that we should have um a psychology degree um uh you know to be able to um really help people because sometimes we are we're a lawyer but people sometimes have to vent to us not because they're angry but just to get it off their chest and you know um so we do a bit of that as well so i think that once that relationship is in place and then we find the right case manager who can again build on that relationship and then they can open up to them and we can find out exactly what that person needs um, from a personal perspective, from a family perspective, from a societal, societal perspective, and we can do our best to, to take that um, um, in place. And I think the first thing, the most important thing is, is the INA, the initial needs assessment, that we can just deal with the short term straight away, get them down that path. Um, to at least immediate treatment and then we can worry about the long term because these claims take years and years but let's just get the immediate sorted get an interim payment get the right things in place and then we can take our time to make sure we get the long-term package in place um, for the rest of their life great thanks uh, shabnam can i come to you next please with the same question yeah, thank you. And um, I think everything that's been said so far, I absolutely would agree with. It's um, it's really great to think about case management as a set of lots of different skills applying to lots of different people. And it made me think, actually, um, that excellence in case management depends on who your audience is in some ways. I would absolutely agree with Stephen that the underlying um, focus, certainly initially, has to be the therapeutic relationship. It must be the um, that human to human sort of contact, if you like, to be able to think about um, what the needs are. But I suppose if I'm talking to a client, um, they will want me to be someone who's in there, in it for the long haul. They want to believe that I've got the skills and the specialisms to be able to support their needs, to see what it's like to walk in their shoes and to imagine what it's like in their life and to be able to help them advocate for their needs. If I'm talking to Stephen and other legal colleagues, I think they would say, do a great assessment, help us understand where the need is, do that in a timely way, do that in a thorough way, think holistically, think mind, body, emotions, physics, phys the, the, um, the physical needs, think about everything that we could, you know, that we, we might need to consider for this client. Um, and then help us understand how that progression is happening. What are those outcomes? How are we going to be able to litigate on behalf of this client? How are we going to think about the funds as well? I think if I'm talking to um, support workers or um, sort of the professional network around the client, they want to know that we're able to, to think together, that there's some kind of cohesive approach 
to um, what we're doing as opposed to someone over there doing some work, someone over there doing some other work, and it not necessarily relating and pulling together in, um, you know, from a psychological perspective, you know, with that story, that cohesive formulation underpinning what we're all collectively cohesively doing together. And I think if I were, talk to, were to talk to the case manager, they would say, you know, I can only be as good as I can be, but it's, I can be so much more if I've got a good outfit behind me, if I've got great, uh, a great um, organisation that supports me, I've got um, good access to supervision, CPD, you know, I know what I'm doing in the role, this funny role that isn't really well defined if you come from any professional background, really, as I think Joe might have um, touched on, you know, it's different for a, a nurse would look at it differently, a, a, a psychologist would look at doing case management differently. But actually, how do we sort of pick out the, the sort of core skills and help someone transition from their professional background into case management and do that while meeting the audience's needs? There's something about that. And then, of course, the self-care angle, 100 percent on that. Absolutely. Um, there's lots to think about. And so I think excellence is is very multifaceted. And um, yeah, I would I would say it's 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 a full role in that sense, but it needs um, lots of people to help it. And it helps lots of people in their roles as well. Does that make sense? It does. Loud and clear, Shabnam. Um, I think going fifth in this lovely panel, um, I've maybe got a few things to add, but very much echo what everyone else has said. Um, so I think kind of for me, excellence in case management, like you said, starts with the, the right case manager for the client. Um, so the importance of those meet and greets, that no pressure environment, that ability to just meet the client, then meet you, have a very informal discussion about kind of what, what they need, as I say, kind of no pressure. Um, and off the back of that, kind of acting on feedback from clients and solicitors and stakeholders. So I recall one of one of my first clients as a case manager, um, I had a meet and greet with a client. He had kind of three or four other case managers he was meeting. And he came back to me and said that he'd actually chosen me as the case manager because I'd said to him that it was four months to the day since his accident. And he was like, no one else had the idea to say something like that no one else kind of knew my case that in depth to think that this is kind of an anniversary of the accident happening um so that's kind of always really stuck with me as I say to just to just put in those personal things and to to make sure you know the case before you're meeting a client um I think the the other massive thing for me in excellence in case management is is case managers being up to date with their CPD and training I think, as, as Joe said, it's a it's an ever evolving world. There's so much information coming out at the minute. There's obviously advances in technology. But um, as Shabnam said, kind of setting that first assessment and your recommendations kind of sets the pace for the rest of the case. So having those ideas already in place, say, if it was a, a spinal injury client or an amputee client of knowing what technology is out there at that point or knowing what research is coming out so that you can um, kind of influence the costings for the solicitors like Stephen to go to the other side um, in terms of interim payment and funding to make sure that we're preventing delays as the case goes on. So really just setting that scene at the beginning with that case manager client relationship and knowing what's out there as far as possible or what's coming um, that, that you could use or can influence the case going forwards. Thanks, Sophie. Great to hear that real world example there. I'd like to open it up now and talk about some of the challenges that you face as case managers. And we'll have a bit of a chat about that, but then move on to opportunities, innovation, new approaches. So uh, I'll just ask uh, which of our panellists would like to kick off that discussion about some of the challenges that you face and things that act as barriers. Uh, uh, and if they were removed, it would allow you to do even more with even greater impact. Can sure. I pick that up, Alistair? Hiya. Yeah. yeah, I think we've all sort of touched on this earlier, but I do think the challenges are the fact that we have an amazing trauma system, which is surviving people who might not have survived 10 years ago. Unfortunately, we don't have the same level of supports in the community currently. Um, so I guess um, Stephen was talking earlier about getting resource to be able to manage 
good case management. And I think case managers' challenges at the moment are really working from that um, pathway from trauma center into the community with highly vulnerable clients really early on and trying to join up those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle is really is is really difficult at the moment because staffing and resourcing of local authority and multi-agency areas is is challenged like I don't remember before actually um, so I think also for us in getting a really strong um, case on liability early, which is which is sort of brokered by the lawyers and the insurer um, decision, provides us with some resource. As Shabnam was saying, it's really important to have the continuity. So what you don't want to be doing as a case manager is starting to involve yourself in advocating and moving this pathway forward for a client where resource dries up or isn't available. Um, because although we can, and we're very, very skilled, all of us, at accessing ICB resources, you know, mental health resources, health CHC funding where it's needed and bringing that together. The actual man on the ground, woman on the ground, is, is very challenging to find now um, uh, and very stretched. So I think when we step into this lane I'm going to call which is a case manager lane because we're not part of the litigation and we are you know our duty of care is to that client not ultimately to the court um it feels like a huge responsibility to start that journey in a very sustainable way uh, and I would say for 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 us as case managers that that is quite a significant challenge at the moment um, because our, our system is evolving, but it's it's very patchy a, across the country um, at the moment, and that that makes for quite a, a sort of a um, a stressful a stressful journey, which needs to be um, well managed because multi agency working is essential for. The, the long term management of clients in case there, there aren't there isn't funds available. You have to be working in a multi agency way with GPs, local authority health to ensure that that client's journey is shored up, especially brain injury for the rest of their life. And I would say that that's a big environmental change at the moment. Thanks, Joe. Would anybody else like to come in on that subject? Sophie? I think I'd echo kind of Joe's thoughts on that. I think it is a big challenge at the minute. Um, obviously, as far as possible from a, a case management perspective, we try and exhaust all NHS options, local authorities, statutory services prior to, to kind of going to the solicitors or the insurers and, and asking for funding. Um, I think kind of a challenge we do come across is maybe when when the NHS, as, as Joe's mentioned, kind of the, the trauma pathway and rehab prescriptions in place that x y and z therapy is coming later down the line but waiting lists at the minute it's kind of that weighing up how much of the delay is there going to be and how much is that going to affect my client i mean from a physio background i used to get so frustrated kind of um with with um patients being discharged in hospital home because they were able to get to the loo that's a very short term goal just because they were able to functionally get to the toilet knowing that then it was going to be two, three, four months until they were seen in the community by therapists, thinking to myself, very much with my physio head on, what compensatory strategies are they going to have learned in the meantime? How much of a worse position are they going to be in by the time that th therapist gets there because they found their own ways and means of doing things, but means that they're not using the right muscle groups, they're not doing things how they should be doing. And all of that affects everything else. By that point, they, they might have kind of lost hope in the system. They've lost hope in their rehabilitation. Expectations won't have been managed. It's weighing up how far you can wait for those delays for NHS input to be in place. And then it may be very short lived of, I know some services only offer four community sessions, some only offer six. It's that typical postcode lottery versus, as I said earlier, kind of preempting things with your solicitor, with your insurer, if you're lucky enough to have funding available um, to, to kind of say as far as possible we will try to utilise the NH services 
NHS services, but with delays in mind, with restrictions in mind, this may be needed. And it's knowing when to call that decision to give your client the best shot going forwards. Thanks, Sophie. Anybody else in challenges? Nikki? Yeah, I absolutely agree with both Joe and Sophie. I mean, <clears throat> one of the massive challenges is statutory services versus sort of private services and, and when to bring in the private services, because like Sophie has just said, you know, sometimes you can get some brilliant um, input from the NHS, but you might actually have a, a very large delay. Um, and I think that's where the case manager really needs to clinically justify um, what it is that they are recommending um, um, and to suggest, like, like both Joe and Sophie have said, is when that needs to happen, whether it's going to be explore the statutory services and, you know, if they can't come in and support that client in a timely fashion, then it's, it's going to those private services. Um, and that's where um, knowledge of rehabilitation, knowledge of the MDT, knowledge of the condition um, and geographical knowledge um, around that client is incredibly important that the case manager has all of that. And I know that Joe's also mentioned about having a, you know, a fantastic team behind them. Um, that is also really important as well because um, you can then... Uh, speak to colleagues, speak to your office staff, um, you know, get people to do some research for you. So having that that team, that structured team behind you to support you with those those challenges is really important. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, Shabnam. Thank you. And it's it's really interesting because I, I absolutely hear um, those challenges. And I suppose maybe um, what it makes me think is um and that is that that piece around um interdisciplinary collaborative working because that then will help guide where it is that we need to put our efforts where it is that we need to then put our funding where it is that we need to then think about the goals of the clients and how we can then make best impact with the resources we have and that is where we then talk about um you know, kind of the, the from the legal perspective, we have to kind of work that out with our sort of wider team, if you like. So I I, I think it, it is a huge challenge, but I do also see potentially that there is a um not a not a way out or a solution per se. Like it's 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 a crappy situation, right? Um sometimes where you are just, you know, you you have all these things that you want to do because you've just done this really amazing INA that says do all of this stuff. The funding is limited, you know, the, the the resources aren't amazing, or you don't know where to go for the resources. But it, you know, for me, that's where, and I'm thinking with my sort of trauma informed psychological hat on, um, that sort of story, that narrative, that what we would say formulation helps guide and channel where we could go in line with what the, what the client actually wants in their life. Because lots, I'm sure we, like all of us, we want lots and lots of things, you know, to improve our lives, but they're gonna be some things that have more of a priority. It helps us maybe um, unpick and maybe um, work out where we can then be most effective and have the biggest impact when it comes to where our clients are in their life and how um, how we can really um, improve that quality of life because that's what it's all about at the end of the day for me at least anyway and I'm sure actually for all of us but um, yeah I, otherwise I can see how we can get so sideswiped and sidetracked and distracted and confused about where to go we, we and relying on one another to be able to um, work out a, almost a consensual way forward in line with the client's voice um, can help maybe with a with a bit more direction and a bit more guidance, really. Thanks, Shabnam. Uh, Stephen, and then I'll bring in Nikki. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, obviously my perspective is slightly different. Um, you know, I always, I always tell clients, um, let us worry about the litigation, no matter how stressful it is, so you can um, concentrate on your treatment and try to get better and do the best that you can. It doesn't always work. Sometimes things are nice in theory, but uh, in practice, they it doesn't really work. But uh, I guess it, it really is the same. The issue that I have and I, is what everyone is saying is that funding, funding, obviously, without funding, you can have the best ideas. 
um, but if there's nothing people have to make a living i'm not criticizing anyone but if there's no funding um then obviously things stall and um that's our job as a lawyer sometimes it falls on our shoulders and rightfully so you know we're, we're representing the client to get them the funds so you know it's our responsibility um to do that and i mean this you know i just once had a case very i'm currently dealing with this case a woman has a, a very very nasty accident she was working she has uh, i think four or five children can't remember exactly how many but she was earning a very good living very nasty accident um, um defendant sends her to get gets us an ina i say can I have some money to implement the ina that you um initiated no no they're not giving an interim payment um, it's just like it's bizarre right and um so now i'm having that fight um with the with the insurance company well the solicitor for the other side and it's 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 quite it's quite frustrating um you know th that can be quite frustrating but a good development recently in the last few months and i'm sure everyone around um this uh, virtual table um is aware of it you know there was recently a court of appeal decision that um obviously we have cost budgeting now the courts are very on top of the fees that solicitors charge um, experts charge, case managers, OTs, everyone, they want it all budgeted. And very, there was a very good court of appeal decision that overturned the first instance decision that a solicitor can claim back the time that they sit in on meetings with case managers because at the first instance, the court said, that's not really directly related to the litigation and therefore, um, um, this time the solicitor spends, they can't recover those costs. And they put in the budget, I think it was around 60 to 70,000 um, pounds for those costs. And thank, thankfully, thankfully, it was overturned at the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal said, in principle, those costs can be recovered. And that's really, really important because, um, you know, we're fighting for the funding. We need to know um, in depth what we need to claim for. It's all very nice having a report, but black and white isn't everything. We need to really know in between the lines. And you only know that by sitting down with the experts, by sitting down with the case managers and with the clients around the table. And, you know, you'll get much better feel than just reading a report. A report, of course, is important, but it's it's not the, it's not the end of it. And so a very, very good development that at least we can sit down and then we can do our best. The case managers will give us, listen, in the best case scenario, unlimited funding, we want, you know, a whole shopping list. And But we need that because we need to know what to aim for. Um, you know, that's fine. I think that's very helpful. I always tell people, give me everything and I'll do what I can do. Um, but then we can then take that and then do our best and get as as much as possible in place um and so i can say funding and you know that does fall on our shoulders but with a good case manager they understand and then when we get what we get then we can work out the best plan and a case manager will know what to prioritize and how to how to um, allocate the, the, the limited funds that we have because no matter what happens you're going to have limited funds it's just it's just the way it is that sounds like an important development, Stephen. Uh, and I think we all know how important it is that we have uh, legal representatives making sure clients get what they need and what they deserve as well. Uh, Nikki? Yeah, absolutely. And also just listening to everybody else talk, I think it's worth bigging up, you know, the therapist, the clinical case manager, because everybody's talking about problem solving. Um, and I think um, therapists in particular in, in their training, in their, um, you know, experience of being a case manager, they are incredibly good at problem solving. Um, so I think, you know, having someone that has that ability to look at something and think differently, think outside the box, look at maybe the funding that they have and sort of think, well, that's not going to meet everything. But, you know, I can I can use a bit for here and something for there, get to the statutory services for something else. So it is it's very much looking at the whole picture and, and you know, problem solving it. There was another challenge that um, or a barrier that um, I find in my case management work, and that is um, the, the carer crisis. So we work with a lot of complex um, injuries, complex clients that have had brain injury, spinal cord injury, um, and they will have a care team around them, uh, quite often a 24-7 care team. And um, direct recruitment and retaining carers is, is really quite challenging at the moment um, you, you again you have to be quite innovative think outside the box to um, retain them you know think about their working environment to ensure that you're offering the best that you can um, but that that I find is quite a challenge at the moment um, and I don't know if anybody else is finding the same yeah I, I see lots of nodding heads there I suspect that's in common with most care sectors actually uh, Nikki but Joe did you just want to come in there 
Yeah, I just wanted to come in and dovetail in with that, Nikki, because I think the other thing that, that I'm, I'm finding quite worrying is actually safeguarding concerns and local authority safeguarding teams are extremely challenged because, as I said in the opening piece, is actually people are, are, are not as resilient. I think a post-COVID legacy is that there is, there is a, a really low area of resilience in many areas of the country that are struggling to get back on their, their feet. And the care crisis, absolutely, as you say, there is, um, there is a high turnover, a ridiculous amount of turnover, both in agencies and direct employ. And, and I, I think we all have to talk about this at some stage because it makes the whole system very fragile. And those clients who are hugely vulnerable and they're in those disseminating circles around them of family, friends uh, and a broader audience are really challenged by the lack of consistency for care, for rehab, for all of these things that map that journey out. Um, and local authority safeguarding services are absolutely creaking. Um, and uh, I, I know from our own safeguarding officer and deputy, uh, those safeguarding concerns have pretty much doubled. Um, and not necessarily because of the case management, because of life and because people, um, as, as Shabnan said, don't have the tools. They, they find themselves in this really new world of lawyers, health, rehab people, people coming into their house, no privacy, um, and they feel out of control, and that spirals them into a, into a sense of real vulnerability uh, and, and, and expressing actions that ordinarily would never have featured in their lives or their family's lives. And, and I think for that in case management, there's a big concern about that. And, and, and we need to we need to have a, a larger countrywide conversation about that at some stage, I think. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And that may be the subject of a separate discussion that we have uh, at some point. Can I move us in from challenges on to opportunities? And particularly, you know, it'd be nice to hear about new approaches, innovations. You might want to talk about, you know, examples of leadership where things are working much more effectively because things have been changed or new approaches have been developed. So innovation, new approaches, uh, opportunities, things that are moving forward and improving uh, case management. Nikki and then Joe. Um, so we've heard quite a few of us have been saying about working as a team and having a really good team behind you. And I think a few of us have mentioned about supervision. When I started in 2008 as a case manager, while supervision was on the agenda, I don't think it was as um, for in the, in the forefront as it is now, because I think our, our legal colleagues also appreciate um, case managers receiving supervision because they know themselves that the cases can be quite complex, can be quite emotional, can be quite um, intense. And so having that supervision is really important. Um, and I feel that that's um, certainly um, well, well accepted now across the industry. Um, and um, in Stanley Smith Case Management, we um, provide supervision and it's our advanced uh, Babacan members that, that undertake the supervision of other case managers. And I think that's something that's changed in, in the last few years is that um, getting that kind of status, if you like, of, of advanced mem uh, Babacan member has, um, has kind of been able to show through the membership group that someone has reached a certain level of competency and I think that push is um, really important within case management and then we've also seen that IRCM so the Institute for Registered Case Managers is, is over the, the last few years has been building up and moving towards case management becoming a registered profession. And those two membership or three membership groups, actually, um, Babacom, CMS UK and uh, Vocational Rehabilitation um, Association, they've all worked together to kind of guide, um, inform, support IRCM in the early, early stages. And now IRCM are, are kind of moving forward standalone as that, that registration group. Um, and I think that's a bit of a change because 
As nurses, therapists, we're all HCPC registered. Um, really proud of that. That's great. Um, and we have we have to have that to, to work. You know, that's a, um, uh, a statutory requirement. Um, and then IRCM will, will be the same once they're, they're up and running. You know, case managers will then be, be registered and have a competency level that they need to meet. So that's that's quite exciting, really. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, jo, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I, I absolutely echo you, Nikki. The IRCM is doing a phenomenal job. It's, it's one of those things that it's a journey, isn't it? It's not a destination. And I think the IRCM have some ama amazing board members, you know, um, built up from people who have years of experience in the case management industry, but also understand the complexities of this industry and the different stakeholders. So the defendant, the claimant, the, the insurer, which is important for our registration. And it will set a benchmark of what good case management looks like. And the thing about case management is it's is it's always been lovely, hasn't it? Because it's very inclusive of all different professional backgrounds. It's it, it doesn't sort of hone in on one. So I think the IRCM it will be phenomenal. I, I absolutely endorse what you were saying there, Nikki. I think from a creative point of view, I think the other things that we've noticed as a company and we've listened to our case managers and we've listened to our internal team culture and they want to work a lot more together. So we've we've developed a virtual rehab platform where we have consultants in rehabilitation come and problem solve pathways for clients. So where you've got a very complex situation, a case manager and case managers largely work from remote bases, so it can be quite lonely. So um, we've developed this platform, we pay for it annually, and we pay for the consultants to come on. It's a superb learning tool for CPD. It's run every month. People bring a couple of case studies, they problem solve it, the consultants in rehab take a sort of overview of it, endorse the pathway being taken or maybe suggest a different route, particularly in polytrauma where you can sometimes get stuck because the NHS doesn't have the same um, physician coming in all the time. So it can give a different approach. It also gives new case managers and the old guard a bit of a chance to sort of learn from each other, get that fresh approach, fresh set of eyes, and, and those who have been within the industry longer, um, a chance to learn from each other and reach out and just have a natter because we don't see each other. We probably see each other at conferences. Um, and the other thing is, is our action learning set groups, which again, we get we have in the north, Midlands and south. And that's another great network. We all know the fundamental dishonesty cases being pushed out and the involvement of case management in those at the moment. You know, Shaw and Henry, these are big cases that have implications for case management, um, rightly or wrongly. I, 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 you know, but I think if we can all come together, unpick our workload and our cases and discuss them. What happened here? What, you know, how can we ensure as case managers that we, to the broader um, industry, that we talk about it and we support each other and we learn from the good and we learn from the not so good. Um, so I think lots of creative things have come out of uh, sort of over the last few years and getting more accessibility to each other. Um, and CMS UK and Babicom conferences are absolutely phenomenal they just get better and better for us in the industry so shabnam you wanted to come in yeah um it's funny because when i thought of um the question innovations i started going down this rabbit hole of i don't know technology and you know kind of the word innovation makes me think of i don't know high-tech stuff but you're absolutely right nikki and joe it is about the so we're we're service providers we're not products are we we don't offer and we talk sometimes about our services being products but actually it's about um you know how we relate how we think about um, the people and how we can get the best out of that, um, the relationship and the skills that, that are out there. And so, yeah, supervision, reflective supervision, which is kind of a bit of both of what you've just said, I think is really important to, to um, maintain. And I, I don't know how um, 
Well, I don't think super. I agree. I don't think supervision is necessarily well defined because it dif depends on whether you're a nurse or a psychologist or a OT or whatever. But I think there is a. There's got to be a universal definition that includes reflective uh, practice within that, and something about peer networking and collaboration. Um, we, you know, it sounds like we've all got different mechanisms that we use with our teams to harness um, that. Um, I was going to shift it slightly to more of an innovative conversation, perhaps, that's happening in case management. And that's the one around diversity. Um, you know, it's an uncomfortable topic um, to talk about um, race, um, ethnicity, inclusion, religiosity, you know, kind of how people identify how they define themselves. And I think it is a conversation that I think has been um i think globally and in society has been talked about a lot more than perhaps it has been in case management but i think we're being a lot braver i think we're being a lot more um reflective and thoughtful around um you know our positions in society our positions with our clients our um you know kind of our own biases our own um you know sort of um privileges i guess ultimately and i just wanted to acknowledge that as an innovation an, inno an innovative conversation that is happening and i can see that at cms uk and Babacom. um we are trying to bring that to the fore and i think that is absolutely brilliant um because i think we would say that there's an underrepresentation of diversity in case management across many different not just ethnicity but many different um sort of uh sort of categories and demographics but equally i think i would argue and i i haven't seen a hard statistic on this but my eyeballing of the data and talking to different colleagues is that there's an overrepresentation of um uh, diversity, if you like, ethnicity, particularly in our case managed client demographics. And that's partly because we hear that those statistics and those um, sort of um, uh, systemic biases that result in more injury, potentially for, um, you know, non white clients. And so you would you can see easily then how we have a lot more uh, refugee um non-white um you know non-english speaking whatever um diverse clients in our cohorts because they are disadvantaged as a result of lots and lots of things and we have to be able to say how much of that is systemic how much of that is individuals perhaps not viewing clients in an equitable way and that's not comfortable, but we are trying to brave through that and push through that. And I'm, you know, I really commend case management for trying to grab this conversation and um, run with it um, as best as, you know, we can. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there as, a, as an innovation, in my opinion. <laughs> Thanks for raising that, Shabnam. Uh, Stephen, and then I'll bring in Sophie. Yeah, um, in terms of innovation, obviously, from my perspective, I'm... I'm I'm not at the coal face. I'm not at. I'm one step removed. Um, I very. It's. I think an innovation was that recent court decision. That that really is um, uh, of innovation, so to speak, because it's a. It solidifies as a court of appeal binding decision that we can get those costs back. We can work with the case managers more closely. But I think in terms of innovation, we do rely heavily. Solicitors we rely heavily on the case managers because they will know what new treatments are up and coming. They will know. Um, things that have changed, um, things on the cutting edge, and obviously, I don't really research too. I mean, I, I do read up on it, but things that are really brand new and things that that will might make a difference, we do rely a bit on the on the case managers, and then we do our best to present it in a report. We go to the experts if it's a neurological issue. Obviously, we'll go to neurologists if, if it's a brain injury. If there's other issues, um, we'll go to to other experts and say this is a new treatment. This is a new um so something that's maybe not even on the market officially yet what do you think will this uh, is it worth exploring is it is it something we can claim for and obviously then we will hopefully get evidence to back it up and then we can present it um to the insurance company present it to the court and see if we can get funding for that and i think you know again uh, we we the case managers bring it to us and we try to uh, justifies the wrong word but we try to um, get the evidence is probably a better way to do it and the evidence to back that up that it's something that is worth getting funding for you know you're not going to get it on the nhs because obviously they have their own processes which is fine but let's you know it's in we try to 
uh, say, you know, it's in the insurance company because the the better treatment, if it, even if it's more cost upfront, but if the long term goal, if the long term effect is to um, reduce the uh, need for the client to rely on other uh, uh, carers or adaptations, then well, in the long run, the person or the insurance company will save money. And it's always that difficulty in, in, in balancing out the short term expense versus the long term expense, because you see the short term, and there's no guarantees that the short term expense is going to pay off. Um, but you know, we do our best to, to give our clients the best treatment possible that money can buy really and so to give them the best opportunity uh, for a, a good long-term outcomes great thanks Stephen. Uh, and finally on that subject sophie yeah so my my kind of thoughts follow on quite nicely from Stephen's actually so so like Stephen was saying kind of the the new technology that's coming out the new equipment but kind of hand in hand with that i think just getting access to that new knowledge out there so I, I know covid was was bad for us in that we we all went more remote we, we don't see people as much we work more remotely generally um but actually things like webinars have boomed and just being able to slot in a webinar in your day on something that has come up some new technology that has come out um a legal update that's useful to know um I, uh, I get laughed at quite a lot. I absolutely love LinkedIn. It is my favourite social networking platform. But my God, just following the right people on LinkedIn, the amount of LinkedIn influencers there are nowadays who who put research on and you just jump down the rabbit hole and find out something new or new technology that comes out or new magazines that have started, like the Case Management magazine, obviously the Babacom magazine that's now out there that are available both kind of paper form and digital form. Things are just so easy to access now. That if you've kind of got five ten minutes slot, I I, I I jump down the rabbit hole. I come out and my brain explodes because there was just so much going on. And I think kind of it's COVID was was terrible for so many things, but actually things now being so much easier to access and digitally and conferences now being both kind of the option sometimes of hybrid approach of either going face to face, but if it's miles away, then there is the option to to kind of engage with it remotely from the comfort of your own home or just kind of do part of the day if you've got another commitment I think technology is expanding and it is crazy scary but it is getting so much easier to find the new developments rather than kind of in the moment thinking I've got a new client they need this I've already kind of got a catalogue in my head of oh I'd seen that on LinkedIn I saved it somewhere I'll just go back to it and reread it I think that the opportunities at the minute are are endless and I, as you can tell, I'm, I'm quite excited to see where it goes in terms of the, the new knowledge and learning and CPD. That's a fantastically positive way in which to sort of draw this discussion towards a close, Sophie. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, we've been discussing this subject, the rising stars of case management, actually for about an hour. It feels like much less than that because it, it does feel as though we're just scratching the surface and we can spend another hour talking about this, but we said that we'd keep our discussion to about 60 minutes. So I'd like to finish off just by whizzing around the panel. Uh, and I apologize in advance for asking each of our panelists to keep their final thoughts to just a sort of 20, 30 second soundbite. And I think what our audience would really like to hear is your thoughts on the reasons for optimism. You know, if there was one or two things that you thought would, if not fundamentally, significantly move forward case management, or keeping in mind that I hope legislators and decision makers, uh, that some of the big obstacles as well as some of the opportunities might be watching this, uh, you know, what would you say to them? So one or two big things or a simple message from you about reasons for optimism uh, with reference to case management in the future. Uh, Nikki. I apologise. I'm going to start with you again. So that's okay. Sharp final thought. Okay, my little sound bite, if you like, is um, to summarise it all up in my head. I feel that that cohesive working locally within your own team, your own company, you know, getting that reflective uh, supervision support is really important. But not only that, I think those conversations and that cohesive working needs to stretch countrywide in between different companies different professionals um uh, sort of uh, so that we can uh, all kind of learn from each other 
Um, I'm very excited about the membership groups. Over the last few years, they've all kind of been offering such fantastic support and education into the world of case management. So I think, you know, engaging with membership groups is, is a fantastic way forward. And also, obviously, um, I'm really looking forward to see uh, where IRCM, you know, uh, goes and becoming registered with IRCM and, and obviously taking on board, you know, their feedback as well. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Joe, your one or two big hopes for the future? IRCM and registration is super important because I think it it's a it's a kite mark of 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 excellence really and that's really important. I agree with Nikki and everybody on the panel that actually collaboration um, in terms of building a culture of sharing um, and not coveting. So international collaboration because rehabilitation is being so um, you know so involved in Australia, New Zealand. India, China, there's some brilliant stuff coming over and we, we need to talk more about that. I also would just like to give a shout out to CQC because I know they're struggling at the moment to get their new systems up and running. But actually, I love being part of that CQC um, regulation. I think it's quite exacting and as it should be because we're all working with complex clients with a variety of needs socially, psychologically, and physically, and uh, and I like being held to account. Thanks, Joe. An important reminder of that global context. Uh, Stephen, final thoughts? Yeah, um, I just like, I think people that are watching this who may need case managers or may need legal help, just, I know it's easy to say, and not always easy to feel, um, but you can be positive. Um, there is the help out there. There are people, there are great um, case managers, OTs, solicitors, um, you may just maybe struggle to find the right person, but whatever your situation, the help is out there and for people to get the, that individual what they need. Um, so again, I know it's easily said and these people, their lives have been changed um, in untold ways, um, but if there's one you know, a bit of positive you can have is that there are people that there that not only can help you that want to help you. So it may take you a little while to find the right person, but that person is definitely there somewhere in the country, and it's not a needle in a haystack. Um, there are there are plenty of people that can help. So just be positive and um, continue your search, and you will you will find the right person. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, Shabnam. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've come to the conclusion that we have two superpowers, collaboration and information sharing. If we can maintain those skills and that um, opportunity in our in our work, we cut through all of that safeguarding stuff. We remain regulated and registered in the right way. We get great supervision. We get that community that we we seem to be craving, and I absolutely agree with it. We're able to have those conversations. We're able to think about that cohesive package. What are we doing here together? You know, where are we moving with our client? If we don't remember, I suppose, that we have these superpowers because we can, you know, they sound really standard, don't they? Collaboration, information sharing is kind of what you see all the time, but they are our superpowers. And I want to put that out there as our um, our hope and our, you know, our optimism and our, um, uh, and skills that I think if you are in working in case management, whatever your specific role is, that um, that will be the the glue that keeps it all together, I think. Fantastic superpowers to have. Thanks, Shabnam. <laughs> and uh, Sophie, you get the last word. Yeah, so I probably sounds like it very much echoes everyone else, but I think my optimism for the future of case management is, like some of the others have said, kind of the, the development of IRCM, that um, certificate of proficiency coming out. I think being able to kind of have a level of consistency and standards and safety being ensured between all case managers is going to make a hell of a difference um, and again kind of the standards that come under um, IRCM and Babacom and CMS UK in terms of that ongoing learning and professional and personal development of just kind of as, as you gather I, I love learning kind of knowing what's out there developing more stuff like this where we can learn from each other and and just having accessibility and availability and and um, doing what's best for our clients making sure that we're up to date with knowledge and that we're we're putting the best foot forward for them 
Thanks, Sophie. And on behalf of NR Times, thanks very much to all of our panellists for being so generous with their time and their insight and their experience. Today, you really have heard from uh, the rising stars of case management. Uh, to all those that are watching, thank you for giving up your time and watching. Please share this as widely as possible. It's been a uh, an absolutely fantastic discussion, and it deserves to be seen by as many people as possible. Uh, just a quick reminder to get your nominations in for the NR Times Awards. Uh, the deadline is the 30th of September, so you've still got quite a bit of time to get those in. Uh, thanks once again to our panellists for a fabulous discussion, and thank you to all those that are watching. Please share this far and wide. Thank you.